And I think they're moral issues. Television evangelist Jimmy Swaggart made a tearful confession before his congregation on February 21st, 1988, of unspecified sin. I have sinned against you, my Lord. He stepped down from his pulpit. It was reported that Swaggart had paid a New Orleans prostitute to pose in the nude. Swaggart had been accused of setting off the sex scandal, which led to the defrocking of televangelist rival Jim Baker. Baker and a top aide were indicted on 24 counts of fraud and conspiracy. Baker had resigned his ministry after admitting to a sexual encounter with the church secretary. I want to get back to preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ and loving and caring for people. Thank you for being here. Bye-bye. Jimmy Swagger's scandal came complete with prostitution and a very tearful on-camera confession. To my fellow television ministers and evangelists, please forgive me for sinning against you. I have sinned against you, my Lord. And I would ask that your precious blood would wash and cleanse every stain. Background here is that Jimmy Swaggart had been going after other televangelists like Jim Baker for marital infidelity for years. When the tables were turned in 1988, he was forced to admit that he himself had um, availed himself of the services of a prostitute. So he confessed with many tears, as you saw. He stepped down from his ministry for three months. Then despite having been defrocked by the Assemblies of God, he went back as an ordained minister of his own Jimmy Swaggart Ministries. Then, three years later, he was busted with another prostitute in his car, at which point he told his congregation that his proclivities were, and I quote, none of your business. So Jimmy Swaggart, the hooker cry and repent about the hooker, hooker again guy. Not to be confused with Jim Baker, the secretary stripping fraud prison guy. Islam allows four wives. He just corrected me, said up to four. I said, well, <clears throat> Mr. D. Dot, Christianity only allows us one, so I had to get the best on the first shot. So he said, but you see, Christianity allows us only one, and I have to choose the best. <laughs> get the tape, get the tape. He said, I have to choose the best. And you know, the best was not good enough. Look, look, this, all these tele-evangelists, all, one by one, they're all falling. Reverend Mar, 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 Marvin Gorman, an evangelist, you know, tele-evangelist, he appears on television, tantalizing millions. He was caught with a prostitute. Jim Becker, Jim Becker, with Jessica Hans, another prostitute. Jimmy Swaggart, average of two trips to the prostitute for his satisfaction. I said, you laugh at us, you are a fool. I said, the laugh is on you. <laughs> you Americans, you have a problem. You British, you have a problem. You French, you have a problem. You Germans, you have a problem. And to these, there are no solutions in your book. No solution. Islam gives an answer to your problem. He's a prominent religious evangelist known around the world for his controversial writings about Islam and the Koran. Tonight, he is in custody in Baldwin County, charged with trying to burn down a condominium high-rise in Daphne. He says he is from the hometown of Jesus and claims to have preached the gospel in 82 different countries. Tonight, Dr. Anis Sharous is accused of putting dozens of his Daphne neighbors in danger. By the Spirit of God, who was his father? My friends. He is a Christian evangelist who has infuriated Muslims worldwide by questioning the Quran. 
Anish Sharous claims fanatic Muslims tried to kill him on three different occasions. Last night, here at the Loma Alta condominiums in Daphne, Sharous was arrested and is facing charges of attempted arson. Well, right now we're treating it his intent was to burn down Loma Alta Towers. Um, you know, he started a fire in the basement of Loma Alta Towers. You live in a high rise and it, it there's, there's always a concern about uh, some sort of disaster happening. Police say Sharous was trying to torch the building in which he lives. There may, however, be a different motive. Well, that is the trash bin that police say Sharous started on fire in the garage here at the Loma Alta condominiums late last night. NBC 15 News has found out that inside that trash bin is a box full of tax documents, apparently from Sharous's Evangelical Association. Police would not comment on the tax records found inside that burned trash bin. Potentially, we could be looking at several, um, you know, death investigations or several murder investigations. We could have several people that uh, wouldn't be with us today. Now, police say Sharous is also facing charges of criminal mischief for dismantling a security system at the Loma Alta condos last week. He is in jail in Baldwin County tonight. A top story at 10 o'clock. Surveillance tapes may hold clues in a shocking arrest. He has stirred controversy worldwide. He even claims radical Muslims have tried to kill him. Now, well-known evangelist Anis Sharous is accused of trying to burn down a high-rise condominium in Daphne. Authorities tell NBC 15 News they are now reviewing surveillance tapes recorded last night at the Loma Alta condos. Dozens of families live there, including Sharous's. Police say these are people whose lives could have been lost. NBC 15's Jenna Susco joins us live from that condominium tower in Daphne. And Jenna, some folks who live there are just finding out about the fire. Yeah, they sure are, Greg. On their drive home, when they arrived here, we spoke to them. And many were shocked, stunned, those who know Dr. Sharush and his wife, to hear that something like this would happen. Now, the big question on everyone's minds is why. Why would someone want to burn down dozens of homes, including his own? Well, that's a mystery investigators are working to solve. He's preached before thousands, served as an evangelist in the Middle East, even authored a book about the attacks on America. Now, Dr. Anish Sharoush is in jail, charged with attempted arson after police say he tried to burn down a place hundreds in Daphne call home. Potentially, we could be looking at several, um, you know, death investigations or several murder investigations. We could have several people that uh, wouldn't be with us today. Investigators say around 10 o'clock last night, while many were sleeping, Sharoush went down to the storage room on the first floor and set the recycling bin on fire. You live in a high-rise, and it, it, there's, there's always a concern about uh, some sort of disaster happening. I just happened to see the red lights flashing on the blinds and looked out the blinds to see what was going on. I saw a fire truck sitting across the street and what looked like paramedics. Neighbors had no idea what was happening, but investigators say it was a calculated move. They say earlier, Sharoush had tampered with the security system. But in a big fire, if you'd have got it going, it's right across the street. Now, investigators tell me that a board member heard the alarms last night and discovered the fire. He was able to quickly extinguish it, so thankfully nobody was hurt, and that fire did not spread beyond that storage room. Reporting live in Baldwin County, Jenna Susco, NBC 15 News. Jenna, thank you. Now, NBC 15 News has learned that a box containing tax records from Sharoush's Evangelistic Association were in that recycling bin police say he set on fire. Police would not comment on those records. The Independence mayor is under fire for the speaker he asked to the annual mayor's prayer breakfast tomorrow. Critics say the speaker will be given a pulpit to preach hate. Amy Holly has that story. Kamal Salim, a well-known self-proclaimed ex-terrorist who once followed the Muslim faith, converted to Christianity years ago. The mayor says Salim will bring a story of redemption to Independence tomorrow, but critics claim it's really a story that's fabricated. Is, is. Mayor Don Rimel says he's going to say a prayer before tomorrow's traditional prayer breakfast. Several groups and an anti-defamation civil rights group, interfaith groups and individuals have all asked him to reconsider his keynote speaker and plan to protest his choice. So far, none of this has changed his mind. What I'm hoping is that when they hear his message, their fears will be 
uh, dissolved. Kamal Salim has been publicly speaking of his religious conversion for 10 years. He tells groups he was raised to hate Christians and Jews, but after a near fatal car accident, he became a devout Christian. The mayor has heard from supporters from all over the world saying his message is a powerful one. And all I want is his testimony. Uh, if he has a story to tell about other things uh, to do with the Islamic religion, that's a, a story for another place and another time. This independence man believes differently. He says the man fabricated his story for money and preaches an anti-Muslim message. Be an Islamophobe for the most part. A person who bashes Islam, bashes Muslims in general with a broad brush. This Muslim civil rights group called CARE says he's also even fabricated his own name. Salim has spoken to universities, churches and military academies. Still, critics here believe it's less a message about finding Christ and more about preaching that the world will soon see a radical Islam invasion. Now, keep in mind, none of the people we talked to has ever talked to Salim or heard him in person. So, the question still remains. Is it a Christian message that's being labeled as hate speech by people who don't believe the same way as Salim does? Or is it a man who uses the Christian message as a veil for an anti-Muslim agenda? 600 people will decide tomorrow at 6.30 p.m. at the Community of Christ Auditorium. Amy Holly, NBC Action News. There's a guy named Kamal Salim, and he gives speeches to right-wing groups and government groups, etc., claiming that he is an ex-terrorist. But thank God he's found the way, he's found the light, and he goes and speaks to these groups, like the Values Voter Summit that just happened. He spoke there. Here, let me give you a sample of what he said. Here, let's go to clip one. My grandfather came from the Ottoman Empire when it fell in 1924 as a general. He earned his scars by the sword of Islam. And when he had my mom, I was born to a Muslim mother who is Zalat. I was trained. And she told me from my childhood, my son, you will die for the sake of Allah. And when you kill Jews and Christians, Allah will celebrate your glory and your hands will light up before the throne of Allah. I was a young lad. I dreamt about killing Jews and Christians. This is my dream as a child. Mm, that is a powerful story. And it got the crowd revved up. They were, Look at this ex-terrorist. You see that? We knew it. We knew all these Muslims were trained at birth to kill Christians and Jews. In fact, he also said, I came to destroy this country as a terrorist. Funny that the FBI hasn't talked to him. But anyway, he's had speaking engagements in not just the Values Voter Summit, but at the state capitals throughout the country, at the Air Force Academy, and at colleges and churches all across the country. And he has an amazing tale to tell. Do you know that he says he's worked for Yasser Arafat, the PLO, Muammar Gaddafi, Saddam Hussein, and the Mujahideen in Afghanistan. And by the way, as you're about to see here in clip number two, he was also indoctrinated by the Muslim Brotherhood. We came, I was recruited in the mosque at young age as many children start attending the mosque in the neighborhood by the Muslim Brotherhood. The Muslim Brotherhood came to history in 1928. I was indoctrinated by them in the mosque, that was my college study. We were taught how to infiltrate civilization and become part of nations and change the nations from inside. How to marry your daughters and obtain the citizenship. How to join your military and become member of your military so we can get the citizenship. How to become chaplain and spy on this nation and give it to our brotherhood. And how to become part of this world and come across the borders to infiltrate your very civilization today. This is in a nutshell. So Kansas City Star sees this and they're like, wait, 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 let me get this right. Muslim Brotherhood, Arafat, Gaddafi, Saddam Hussein, is there anybody you didn't mention? And they called him, quote, the Forrest Gump of the Middle East. <laughs> <laughs> so now this guy it continues with his amazing tales. In fact, he's got one that involves curious sounds and a sad story about a young man uh, that got killed and how proud his mom was that he was killed. Because, you know, it's all Muslims. It's in their culture. That's the story he's really trying to bring to these right-wing voters. Watch. My first master was Yasser Arafat. My first mission was very, very good. You see, the Jews didn't think that children can do such a thing. 
We took advantage of them. The second journey, I was eight, I was a recruiter. I recruited my next door neighbor, Muhammad. And I told his mom, I'll bring him back home alive. I made a promise. But that day it was, they were waiting for us. This is when the blood of children and blood of lamb was mixed together as we're trying to rendezvous with the shepherd so they can put these belts on the, top, on the belly of the sheep and take them inside Israel to give them to Fida'iyin, which is the martyrs. That day, they shot us with everything. Muhammad took shrapnel through his esophagus and he fell down to the ground. I carried him and I'm crying, how I'm going to tell his mom? And I was crying, Mama. That day, Muhammad went a different place. You see, when his mom talked to me, she said, where is Muhammad? You promised he'll be back. I said, he is with Allah. He's celebrating in the host of heaven. Now you can go to paradise without judgment because he became a forgiven like a Messiah to you. And I said, now he's being wed by Allah with 72 version. And with every version, he has 72 other versions. Muhammad is in good place, Fatima. She put her hand to her lips and shouted with a shout of wedding feast. She celebrated her son wedding into the heavens. <laughs> this guy is a colorful character, man. And he's giving them the show that they want. Oh, yeah, Muslims with their weird little calls and stuff. And yeah, they were so ecstatic when their kid died. By the way, this guy also sounds like Father Sarducci from Saturday Night Live. And then you need those two or three miracles. And I tell her, your son has a 72 of virgins. But why would a mom care about that? <laughs> okay, so if you notice, he said in his second mission he was eight years old. According to his accounts, in his first mission when he was running the guns on the sheeps, I'm not kidding, that's what he says, he was seven years old. Who would be so colossally stupid as to believe this? Well, of course, not the authorities. In 2007, for example, in Chino Hills, California, he said that Muslim agents had broken into his Holiday Inn and ransacked the place. Oh, the Muslim Brotherhood's on his tail. When the uh, cops were asked about it, quote, local law enforcement, however, has no record of any such incident. Yeah. Fail. And then in 2007, again, he's speaking at uh, Michigan's Calvin College. Another professor, Doug Howard, professor of Middle Eastern history, notices that he's saying really weird things. And in the middle of his speech, he says that he was a descendant of, quote, the Grand Wazir of Islam. Here's the only problem. There is no such thing. <laughs> That's an awesome fail. He just made it up. He's like, it sounds kind of like wizard, you know? And other things. Oh, la, 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 la. I, the Grand Wazir of Islam. And Doug Howard's like, wait a minute, there's no such thing. What the hell's going on here? This guy is unreal. So, in fact, literally, it turns out his real name is Kodor Shami. That Kalam name, he just made it up. It's Kodor Shami. And in fact, who did he work for for 10 years before we, he came out as an ex terrorist? Pat Robertson's Christian Broadcasting Network and James Dobson's Focus on the Family. Hmm. <laughs> Gee, I wonder where he got all these ideas. Can't quite tell. Come on, come on. <laughs> Even though that's not actually his name. <laughs> all right. Now, uh, he says that he speaks at the FBI all the time and the FBI is communicating because people say, hey, wait a minute, my God, if you were this mastermind terrorist, why isn't the FBI talking to you? Well, he said, oh, yeah, all the time. So they asked uh, FBI spokesperson Kathleen Wright. She said, quote, no information that Kamal Salim has spoken at an FBI-sponsored event. Cannot say definitively whether the Bureau had ever been in contact with him. And I love this line by Dawood Wali. He's the, uh, one of the guys from the Council on American Islamic Relations. Obviously, they realize that this guy's a scam artist. He said, quote, the FBI or the Department of Homeland Security don't let people who are terrorists into the country and not detain them just because they claim they got the Holy Ghost. Keeping them honest every night, AC 360, CNN, weeknights 10 Eastern. Well, full disclosure, one time or another, CNN and other networks have turned to Shubat for his perspective on the war on terror, an apparent look from the inside. But keep it honest tonight, we're discovering that Walid Shubat's story just doesn't seem to add up. 
Here's CNN's Drew Griffin of CNN's Special Investigations Unit. I think we are at war with Islamic fundamentalism and Islamism, which stems from Islam. You know, no historian can deny that Islamists basically invaded Christendom. Walid Shubat's message is the epitome of good versus evil. He has an advertised pedigree that makes him an expert. Islamic terrorist turned ultra-conservative Christian. A U.S. citizen because his mother is American, he is a darling on the terror circuit, the church and university circuits, and yes, he believes the war on terror is a holy war. He portrays himself as a man converted and on a mission. Once a Jew-hating, bomb-throwing terrorist, now a devout Christian convert warning the world, Islam is out to destroy you. That's how you recite the Quran. I know the Quran inside out. English. And if you meet the unbelievers, then smite off their necks. But what part of smite off their necks? Do you Americans don't understand? His message before a largely positive crowd of cops and emergency responders at this South Dakota Homeland Security Conference, trust no Muslim, especially those who organize. Know your enemy. Know your enemy. All Islamist organizations in America should be the number one enemy. All of them, the Islamist organization, the Islamic Society of North America should be focused on. You got that on camera? Yes, please. He is being paid $5,000 plus expenses to speak here with your tax dollars. He was also given a Rapid City police guard during his time in the city. A nice day's work. And judging by his website, where he highlights more than three dozen speaking engagements, Shubat gets a lot of work. Being a terrorism expert has become a cottage industry since 9-11. The Department of Homeland Security has spent nearly $40 million on counterterrorism training just since 2006. DHS doesn't keep records on how much is spent just on speakers. But some of the so-called experts who go around the country teaching, and in some cases, preaching about terrorism and the dangers of Islam are not quite what they seem. People, it turns out, like Walid Shabbat. The first thing I want to ask you is what was the purpose of your talk this morning to these cops and emergency responders here in South Dakota? Well, uh, being an ex-terrorist myself is to understand the mindset of the terrorist, number one. An ex-terrorist, it's Walid Shabbat's claim to fame. A terrorist, a PLO member, who bombed a branch of an Israeli bank in Bethlehem Square, throwing a firebomb on the bank's roof. The problem with the story, with a lot of Shubat's stories, there's no evidence for them. And despite CNN's many requests, neither Shubat nor his business partner have provided us with any. Bombings in Bethlehem Square, you specifically said you threw... The bank was in, 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 in the Bethlehem Square. You threw explosives. Yes, I did. On top of that bank. Yes, I did. No record. CNN's Jerusalem Bureau went to great lengths trying to verify Shubat's story, finding the general location where the branch of Bank Lumi once stood, but not finding anyone who could remember a bombing. We contacted the bank headquarters in Tel Aviv, asking officials to search records. No records found, and Israeli police found no record anyone ever threw a bomb at the branch of the bank. Why would the bank not have a record? Why would the, the Israeli police not have a record? Why would the Israeli police not have a record? I don't know. I mean, I don't know where you check, what dates, all these things. There's another part of his story that doesn't check out. Shubat says he was arrested and spent two weeks in an Israeli prison. There's no record of you being in prison. I think there'd be at least an arrest record. They held you for two weeks. Would okay. the United States know you, you were in prison you, if you were you a U.S. citizen? Well, how about me and you go to the Muscovia prison and extract the records? The records are there. Okay. Well, Would you well, be willing to do so? We did, and the Israeli detention center could find no record of detaining anyone with the name Walid Shabbat. Yeah. You, I mean, you obviously can see why people are critical of of your claims. There's a whole lot of no, gaps in your obviously. story. There's no gaps at all. We, we in my don't story. have a bank bombing. And we don't have a terrorist, because it turns out Walid Shubat, even on his own admission, 
was never charged. I was in prison for a few weeks. Well, was there a charge? No, I was a U.S. citizen, remember? I was born by an American mother. The other uh, conspirators in the act ended up in jail. I ended up being released. There's another problem, his family. In the neighborhood where Walid Shubat grew up, relatives say he was just a regular kid. And Daoud Shubat, who says he is Walid's fourth cousin, goes even further. There were only two banks in Bethlehem district, and they are Bank Leomi and Discount Bank. They were on Nativity Square, and Walid never had any connection with those two banks, not a close or a distant connection. I tell you this is out of experience. I am one of the people who are considered a responsible man in the area of Bethlehem or Beth Sahur. I have never heard anything about Walid being a Mujahid or a terrorist. He claims this for his own personal reasons. So true. He's saying he claimed this for his own personal reasons. What personal reasons? Well, there's a big personal reason here. It's called money. You know, Anderson, I have to tell you, classic investigative reporting, you follow the money. Like his background, how Walid Shabbat is now making that money is about as mysterious as his past. Yeah. The Walid Shabbat Foundation, is that a charity? Yeah. Walid Shabbat Foundation is part of the FFMU. And what does the FFMU do? Basically, we're in the information, and we, we do speaking, and we do also helping Christians that are being persecuted in countries like Pakistan. And uh, we, we help Christians who are suffering all throughout the, the Middle East. And how do you do that? None of your business. None of your business? That's interesting. Uh, our investigation continues tomorrow night, right? Tell us, what, what are we going to see tomorrow? Yeah, tomorrow, how he makes a business out of his expertise, how these donations to his cause end up with a so-called foundation owned by his business partner, and also the bigger question, Anderson, why are our taxpayers going to pay this guy? He can say whatever he wants, but where are the people vetting these so-called terrorism experts that are suddenly making a lot of money in this country? Keep in mind us tonight, we are continuing our reporting on a man named Walid Shubat. He lectures law enforcement groups around the country claiming to be an expert on Islamic fundamentalism and terrorism. He says he himself was once a terrorist and he sells his consulting services, sometimes at taxpayer expense. Last night on this program, we revealed that after much investigation, CNN could find no evidence to back his claims that he was once a terrorist who had been arrested in Israel. And he's not the only so-called expert whose background may not be as advertised. Recent Reporting finds that a number of so-called experts teaching and in some cases preaching about terrorism may not really know what they're talking about. The Department of Homeland Security has handed out at least $40 million in training grants over the past five years, and at least some of that money is spent on speakers like Walid Shubat. Recently, Senators Susan Collins and Joe Lieberman asked the Department of Homeland Security and the Justice Department to account for how federal training dollars are spent for what they called inflammatory rhetoric. Tonight, we look at how Walid Shubat makes his money and what he does with it. Drew Griffin has part two of his investigation. It's clear Walid Shabbat does not like tough questions. It's a stupid question. He became even more defensive when we began asking about his foundations, his tax-exempt status, and all the money he is making. He has turned what some might call hate speech into a career, trading on his past to advise law enforcement officials and religious groups about the threat of Islamic radicals. He says he was a Palestinian terrorist, jailed by the Israelis, but it's a life story based on very little evidence. But it sure pays well. Tax records filed by his business partner reveal his speaking engagements earned more than $560,000 in 2009. So what is it, why the skepticism? If somebody collects half a million dollars, you think it goes to my pocket? It's absolutely untrue. Like his answers, his tax return is vague on specifics, and his various businesses and foundations, well, that's vague, too. Um, you, how much do you get paid for these? Speaking engagements. Not that, not that much. I'd probably, if you look at my salary, I make like a, probably uh, what a gas station makes or a garage makes. I mean, everybody thinks I'm just raking in the dough, which is absolutely incorrect. Yeah. The Walid Shobat Foundation, is that a charity? Well, the Shubat Foundation is part of the FFMU. And what does the FFMU do? Basically, we're in the information, and we, we do speaking, and we do also helping Christians that are being persecuted in countries like Pakistan. And uh, we, we help Christians who are suffering all throughout the, the Middle East. 
And how do you do that? None of your business. <laughs> Isn't it anyone's business who donates to you? Of course, but you see, a lot of the times, if you disclose information who you're helping, you know, it ends up biting them. The business, in fact, Shubat leaves up to his manager, Keith Davies, who was down the hall selling Shubat's anti-Islam books. When CNN had specific questions about the business, like perhaps the names of the high-ranking generals and experts he said are on his board of advisors, well, Shubat said, get the names from Davies. Waleed said that you would be able to tell us about your advisory board. You guys said you have generals and other high-ranking officials. We're, correct, yeah. Can you tell us who they are? Um, off the top of my head, yes. Let me see. Uh, I'm trying to think. The name's gone blank. They'll come back to me in a second. A ma a major General... Uh, La I can't remember. Um, Four star, four star, is a three star general of the Air Force, Irish name, Thomas. I usually know these off by heart and straight up. Um, Davies did come up with one name, a pilot, but no contact details despite repeated requests from CNN. We made calls to the individual anyway, but he never called us back. The group's public tax forms lists only Davies and a real estate developer as board members both with the same address. Shubat and Davies run several foundations and three websites that are all linked. A confusing model, considering the group's tax returns for the past four years contained very little information. In fact, while Shubat has a foundation bearing his name, no tax forms could be found on public sites. Davies said they are merged together. The other question Wally said I should ask you is about the money. Yeah. We won't, uh, that's, well, you don't ask anybody else here about the money. Well, you have all these foundations, and I'm trying to find out where this money goes in terms of charity, what is the foundation? Well, well most of the money is used to help persecuted Christians in the Middle East uh, that the media doesn't want to talk about. I'll talk about it if you can give me any information about Yeah, you have a, we, have a, we have a website that you can have all the information about what we do on our website. It's rescuechristians.org. I read that. It's right. very unspecific as to what exactly is going on, where the money is going. Keith, I got to ask you, because I do a lot of this type mm -hmm. of reporting on charity. Mm -hmm. organizations that collect money for various funds. Mm -hmm. Everything is not very transparent. Is this... Are you running a scam here? Oh, absolutely. A big scam. I'm not answering anymore, but you, you're trying just to, trying to scam us all the time. We are a very legitimate organization. We've been um, around for eight years. Well, we, uh, six or seven years, foreign from Middle Eastern Standard files with the IRS, and you can have a look at the, at the forms. I can even send you the pack, a copy of the tax returns if you want. He never did, but we found some on other websites. The money is coming from universities and churches and from your tax dollars. Some of his appearances are paid out of Homeland Security grants. The DHS in South Dakota told us Shubat was paid $5,000 plus expenses to speak at this event and he was given security. But Shubat told us... No, there's no expenses to pay. The, the hotel I pay myself. The hotel I paid today myself. The bigger question may be why Walid Shabbat is in South Dakota teaching a bunch of cops about Islamic terrorists, a state that has so few Muslims. The local newspaper here in Rapid City says only a couple of dozen live here year-round. Jim Carpenter is South Dakota's Homeland Security Director. What, what was the point of bringing him here? I, I think he brings a point of view that certainly is not necessarily mainstream it's not a South Dakota based point of view uh, he brings in commentary about living and being raised as a Muslim and then converting over to Christianity so why would someone's religious conversion be important to a Homeland Security conference in Rapid City South Dakota you know I really couldn't figure that out and based on further questions I really didn't get a good answer from Jim Carpenter with the South Dakota Department of Homeland Security. The Federal Department of Homeland Security, Anderson, we went to, trying to find out if they do any vetting of speakers, if they had any idea about Chubat. If anyone in the federal government did what we have done, try to check out all his claims. Well, what we got from Homeland Security was a statement that said, if states use DHS grants for speakers, it's up to the states to vet them. We also got this, if training programs do not meet these standards, DHS standards, corrective action will be taken. 
We have not and will not tolerate training programs, says the DHS, or any DHS-supported program that rely on racial or ethnic profiling. Anderson, based on the three sessions we sat in on with Walid Shabbat and our interview with him, we can tell you he does advocate profiling and flatly being suspicious of anybody who's a Muslim. And his reaction to you kind of turned ugly. Yeah, it sure did. Not just him, too. South Dakota's Homeland Security people, they actually tried to keep us out of the conference. We got in only after they had to call the governor's office. As for Shubat, he did get testy. Later sessions, after that interview, he began attacking the media, specifically CNN, for doubting his story. He has since accused us, and you, Anderson, of being used by the Council on American-Islamic Relations, even suggesting that group was the primary source for our reporting, which, of course, is not true. Uh, and, and it's interesting. I mean, if somebody's running a legitimate foundation that's tax-exempt and stuff, I mean, uh, usually they're very willing to be transparent and willing to give documents and stuff. It sounds like those guys were saying, oh, yeah, we'll send you these documents, and then nothing shows up. No, and it's all wrapped in this secrecy and security. Uh, they're under the impression we're asking for the names of some right, Christian which, which families in the Middle East that are being persecuted. We're not. We're just trying to figure out where is the money going because we cannot find out where this money is well, going. Well, it's also in your, interesting in your piece because Shubat said, oh, well, this foundation... Uh, is part of this other thing and it pays for speaking and teaching which basically is what he does oh and also uh, helping Christians the other guy said oh, it mainly goes to helping Christians and yet again no details and I think you could see from the reporting we couldn't get a straight answer right. about anything from just about anybody that reporting continued in our various emails and contacts with these fellows after that uh, it was just a very confusing, and in the past when we've done reporting like this, the more confusing, uh, the, the less transparent things are, the more questions need to be asked, I think, by DHS and other federal authorities. Yeah, interesting that they haven't been. Uh, Drew, appreciate the reporting. Great job as always. Thanks. Coming up. Uh My name is Ergun Mehmet Janer. Is Ergun Mehmet Janer. I came to this country to be, for lack of a better term, a missionary to you. My father was a muazin in the mosque, and he was an architect, and so we came to America to build mosques here. My father was a muazin in the mosque. Father was a muazin in the mosque. I have never worn my laundry on my head. It's called a gefia. No, I never did drive a taxi. I have never worn a silk shirt open to my navel with gold chains dangling in the midst of the chest hairs and going up to people saying, hello, beautiful woman, come with me. Come on, I'll give you ten camels for the woman. Come with me. That was a devout Muslim. Liberty University has announced it will replace Dr. Ergen Kanner as Dean of Liberty Baptist Theological Seminary. This comes after a university board investigation into allegations that Kanner lied about growing up as a Muslim. Jeremy Mills has been following this story. And Jeremy, the school says Kanner will stay on as a professor. He is, after all, one of the most popular professors at LU Noreen, but these allegations appear to have damaged his standing at the university. The four-member board says it could find no evidence showing Dr. Kanner was not a Muslim who converted to Christianity as a teenager, as some has suggested. But they did find discrepancies in other facts about his past. School officials would not go on camera for this story, choosing only to release a written statement. Kanner will step down as dean when his contract expires. June 30th. Reporting live in the Lynchburg studio, Jeremy Mills, ABC 13 News. If there's such a thing as a controversial lightning rod Baptist minister, then one is headed to North Texas. He's the former head of Jerry Falwell's Liberty Baptist Seminary, and his claims of having terrorist ties have clouded his credibility and perhaps his future. Channel A Spreadship has more tonight. Let me tell you what the last two weeks of my life have been. I got hit with oranges. Not what you might expect to hear from the Dean of Theology at Liberty Baptist Seminary, but it's part of the Ergun Kanner mystique and legend of being raised a radical Muslim in Turkey and an enemy of America. I hated you. 
That may be harsh. But as Dr. Hayes told you, I was, my madrasa, my training center was in Beirut. And he says he was trained to be a terrorist when his family moved. And so we came to America. It was 78. Once here, Kanner says he converted to Christianity, then rose to national prominence after 9-11. That's when Tom Rich of Jacksonville, Florida, first heard his message. He said, this is a quote, that he was trained to do that which was done on 11 September. Okay, which means, uh, in no uncertain terms, I was trained to be a terrorist. You know, I was raised to be a terrorist. But last summer, Kanner's story started to unravel when skeptics found evidence that despite his claims... I walked into the Stells Road Missionary Baptist Church in Columbus, Ohio, in full gear, full gefia, and a Quran. The self-proclaimed young jihadist actually moved to the U.S. from Sweden, not Turkey, in 1969, not 1978, and grew up not carrying a Koran, but looking and acting like most every other kid his age. The discrepancies proved so damaging, Kanner was demoted at Liberty and is now headed for North Texas to become vice president at Arlington Baptist College, home to 200 students and maybe a not so welcoming staff. One of which tells News 8, I find it reprehensible that the leadership of Arlington Baptist College would hire a man who is very clearly profiteering from the tragedy of September 11. Back in Florida, blogger Rich says giving counter credibility takes away from the church. Really calls into question the integrity of the organization that he uh, represents. And, um, and it makes it harder to spread the gospel to, to people when they know that Southern Baptists actually are not holding this guy accountable. Canner did not respond to our request for an interview, but is on the record saying he is only guilty of uttering discrepancies and making pulpit mistakes. Arlington Baptist President Dr. Dan Moody declined an on-camera interview, but told us by email, Dr. Canner has our full confidence and we are excited about the future of our school. We consider all the controversy to be in the past and we are moving forward with full confidence. And while Liberty Baptist Seminary officials found Canner made factual statements that are self-contradictory, the chairman of the panel that investigated him says we never once found that he lied. What seems to be at issue now is whether his detractors can now find it to forgive. Brett Ship, Channel 8 News.